I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about CSS tooltips, CSS frameworks, and the usual roundup of responsive web design. We also have special guest Ryan Carson, founder and CEO of Treehouse here. Let's check it out. First up is Hint CSS. Oh, I thought it was Hintses. No, it's actually Hint CSS. I know. thought it was written by that guy from Lord of the Rings. This is basically a tooltip library written in CSS. Now, tooltips are these really cool little things you might have seen in web apps where when you hover over or click on something, a little additional piece of help pops up and tells you something about that button or widget or that particular piece of text. Looks like you can also do it for images. You can change colors here. And now they also have a tooltip that always shows all the time. One of the things that I like about this particular tooltip library is that it's written in pure CSS as opposed to a lot of them which have a lot of JavaScript heavy code to make it work. So that's kind of cool. And these can be such a pain to implement, especially when you want tooltips that are on the left or on the right or up or down and kind of figuring out the logic of all of that. So this is actually really nice because all the work is done for you. You can just go ahead and use this and, uh, you know, just pop it right into your app. Having all the work done for you is really nice. I like it when all the work is done for me. Now, my question <laughs> is, can you create a tooltip on, on all sides simultaneously to mark out a really important element? You could. Uh, I don't recommend it though. Okay. Don't Just know what could happen if you try to do that. Chaos. That's right. Use at your own risk. So next up, over on Bruce Lawson's blog, he has an article called Using the Main Element. Now, the main element is something that's relatively new in HTML5, but it's actually an element. So this is something that you would use in place of something like a div with the ID of main. And something that's nice about it is there is support for it with the HTML5 shiv now. Um, the newest releases have support for it. Now, if you are using the main element in your web pages, it's probably still a good idea to add an ARIA role of main for it, unless your users are using the latest Chrome or Firefox builds. Um, most browsers don't have support for it just yet, so that's why you need to use the HTML5 shiv. Uh, but anyway, we'll have a link to that in the show notes, which you can check out on our YouTube channel. Cool. Well, next up is yet another contender in the arena of CSS frameworks. Oh. It's called Groundwork, and it's currently in beta. And it has basically everything you would expect from a really awesome modern CSS framework. It's built with SAS and Compass. It's flexible, responsive, works on a fluid grid system nestable, etc. All the buzzwords. That's right. And it's free and open source. There's a few more. It's device agnostic, works in all the major browsers. Now, the really cool thing about Groundwork, in my opinion, is just how incredibly responsive it is from a front-end performance perspective. I mean, you just click on each one of these navigation items here, and the pages load almost instantly. In fact, the Groundwork site itself is almost more interesting than the <laughs> framework. Um, but anyway, really, really great CSS framework. Definitely worth checking out. Yeah, we were, we were checking this out earlier, and we were both very, very impressed at the speed. Pretty awesome. So next up, we have a character entity map. There's not too much to say about this, but if you're coding up a web page and you're just racking your brain to see what the exact symbol is for maybe the copyright or numeric symbols, there's uh, a nice link that we'll have in the show notes that has every single character you could possibly want to put on one of your web pages, and it shows you um, the symbol that you would have to use. There is also the UTF character code. Uh, just a few different ways of having these display in your web page. This is a really, really long list, but it's also very visual, which is something that I like about it because you can easily see, you know, the character before you want to put it in your page. So check that out. Pretty, pretty simple. Not too much to say about it. That's but very useful. That's really handy. I mean, yeah. no matter if you're a beginner or really advanced, that's something that you just 
you have to look up all the time. So yeah. it's nice to have a handy reference. So next up is this really cool blog post called There Is No Breakpoint, which is a reference to There Is No Spoon from The Matrix. Oh, I thought it was uh, a reference to Ghostbusters. Uh, no, it's actually not a Ghostbusters reference. Uh, <laughs> anyway, There Is No Breakpoint is about breakpoints in responsive web design. This is basically where you target your media queries towards certain resolutions. So as you get down to an iPad size or you know a phone or get up to a large desktop, you code in these breakpoints in pixels using media queries. And this article is saying that that's actually maybe not the best way to go about things. Instead, you should do it based on each particular feature or component of your design. So as your as your screen resolution is getting smaller or larger depending on the device, you should actually just look at each part of the design and decide on an individual basis where they work across that whole spectrum of resolutions. So really interesting blog post, definitely worth checking out. Yeah, that's that's thought provoking. It is. Sounds like a lot of work though. It does sound like a lot more work. I was thinking about that too, but you know, maybe it actually isn't because you definitely spend a lot of time figuring out where those breakpoints are. You might spend a lot of time digging into your site analytics to try and figure out those breakpoints. And you know, it's it's a lot of friction either way. So this might be faster. It's hard to say. Hmm, cool. We'll read the blog post, decide for yourself. That's right. Next up, we have a new JavaScript plugin from Twitter called typeahead.js. Now, this gives you the typeahead kind of autocomplete functionality that you've seen on tons of different websites at this point. So that's where you're typing something and it will actually type the rest of the sentence or right. now, thing for you. As right. an example, I'm on the screen here. I type the letter B and then you can see the different projects that Twitter has that are open source and you can press the up and down arrows to select them. Enter selects it, and you can add this right into your text box. Uh, pretty, pretty easy to use, very fully featured. It has a bunch of different configuration options, and it's by Twitter, so you know it's going to be supported for at least a little while. And if you're using a Bootstrap-based site, it'll work pretty well with that. Cool. Yeah, that's like awesome. It. So next up is another blog post. This one is called How to Design for Android Devices. And this is something that I've actually been interested in myself, and... This blog post makes a great point by saying that up until now, the Android platform really hasn't had a very mature design language. It's kind of been a little bit all over the place. I, I think they started out a little bit differently from, say, iOS, which started out with a strong design language. But Android has matured quite a lot in the past few years, not just on the development side, but also in terms of design. And so this blog post just walks through all sorts of common design patterns that you find on the Android platform, such as the back button, different screen resolutions. They have this really nice starter kit. So it's a really cool post if you are designing Android apps or if you're just trying to create a really great web experience on an Android device, it is worth digging into those platform-specific features and making a really good experience for those particular users. Because anytime you reuse a design pattern, you're in a much better position to basically educate your users about how to use that user interface. Yeah, they're already used to it. I think I said use like five or six times there. That's okay. But. We liked every single one of them. <laughs> Next up, over on the One Extra Pixel blog, there is actually a great roundup post of 55 great and useful tools for responsive web design. Now, I don't want to shamelessly self-promote too much, but we did talk about quite a few of these on previous episodes of the Treehouse Show, so just maybe go and check out our archive too. Um, but there are tools for pretty much everything that you would need when getting started with responsive web design, different things on different tiles, sketch sheets, um, different possible mock-up and layout tools, and then different tools that we've talked about, things to resize your browser to check for the latest responsive web design. Uh, it's a really thorough blog post, and you'll probably pick up at least one or two things that you haven't seen before. So, sweet. Yeah, definitely check that out. And So, speaking of sweet, yeah. we have a little bit of a, of a special treat for you. Yeah, you guys have been pretty good. You've been well-behaved. You deserve it. We got a chance to 
catch up with founder and CEO of Treehouse, Ryan Carson. Let's see what he had to say. So you recently wrote a blog post titled The 90 Day Plan on RyanCarson.com. What's that all about? Well, uh, it was uh, brought about by a lot of pain and suffering. Um, and the reason why is because uh, most of the stuff you learn when you start a business um, is that you don't know anything about how to run a business or how to scale a team. And uh, I think all of us at Treehouse, we realized, wow, we're really growing. You know, we're, you know, 50 people now. Um, we're, we're past kind of the stage where we could all just kind of chat to each other and, and figure out what's going on. And, um, and someone on the team, Mike Watson, had the idea of creating a 90-day plan. And it's been amazing for us because uh, it's allowed us to focus on a couple things and get them done um, without uh, me completely distracting everybody and, and moving things around. And um, so the best thing I would say uh, for everyone that's listening that's you know, thinking about running a startup or is involved in a company, whether it's a startup or not, is that creating a, a plan that lasts 90 days um, allows everybody to gather around that and clarify, okay, what are we doing here? What's important? Um, what is the priority? Um, and then execute on that. So the way a 90-day plan works is um, you all strategize about, okay, what do we think is important? All right, let's, let's talk high level. And then once we establish the high level things, okay, let's prioritize them one, two, or three. And then um, after you prioritize them one, two, three, then you assign one person that's responsible uh, to execute on that. And then you freeze it and you say, we're not going to mess with it. Um, and, you know, as a, as a founder, entrepreneur type person, I had the tendency to come in and mess with things and say, well, we were going to do that, but now we're going to do this. And, and uh, it, it basically was, was confusing because, you know, as the boss, you know, people would sort of say, okay, well, I guess we're going to do that thing, even though yesterday you said we were not going to do that thing. And, uh, and so it, it actually keeps everybody accountable to execute on what we all agreed was important. Um, and it's been, I've really enjoyed it. You know, I don't know what, what you guys think. I'd, I'd like to hear that. But so far, I think it's helped us to, to stay on task and, and communicate clearly what we want to do. So it's been, it's been good, I think. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's been great. Now, um, a lot of people might not know this, but Treehouse is a pretty distributed company. Mm -hmm. We have an office in Orlando and another one in Portland. And we have employees distributed all over. Uh, what are some tools that you would recommend when running an online business or a business that's distributed like that's that? That's spread out. Um, I would say w we have a core set of tools. Um, one is we use Trello, so T R E L L O.com. And I'm not being paid to say that. Um, and it's just a great, you know, visual Kanban style to do system. And um, I, I personally use that for. A delegated list. So, you know, um, when we just when I when I you know speak to the people that report to me and we decide what needs to be done, we create a board we share and it's called delegated, and that just allows me to go down that list and say, hey, you know, we talked about this. We, you know, how's that going? Because um, it's really easy to kind of ask people to do something and forget you've asked it and you don't check up on it and then it could you know. So that's one thing we use. So Trello's great, um, not just for delegated lists, but we also. It allows people to share um, things across the company they want to get done. It's visual, so you kind of move cards around left to right. So that's great. It's free, so that's really good. Um, we've started to use Google Hangouts a lot more. Um, we, we, we do use GoToMeeting um, and Skype, but um, GoToMeeting is, uh, I think, about 50 bucks a month. And it's good, but the friction is kind of high. You know, you have to have the app installed, and, and every time you install the app, it tells you you don't have the latest version, so it has to install the latest version, and then you wait for that while everyone's saying, what's going on? Why isn't the meeting starting? So um, Google Hangouts have been pretty good. Um, and we use uh, Campfire quite a bit. Um, Campfire is just our, our place. It's kind of like our water cooler, really. So um, because we're spread out, we don't get you know to hear all the funny jokes, or um, especially us people that are not in Orlando. We don't get to see the insanity that happens here, <laughs> and uh, and it's a nice way to kind of tap into that and and hear some of the jokes and be a part of. And that I, I don't really get any work done in Campfire. It's more just um, having fun. I think some of the teams do use it to actually communicate a lot. Primarily our app team, so 
the developers have a room in Campfire and, and they're really active in there. And, um, and what I've learned about developers is that they are very efficient communicating through chat. Um, it used to frustrate me, like, why don't you guys just call each other and talk? This is crazy that you type all this stuff. And they're like, well, we type for a living. Like, that's what we do. Mm. So it's much more efficient. So um, Campfire works well. And um, we tried to cut down on email um, but that never really works. So he just decides to try to be reasonable with email. So, uh, and what is one piece of advice you would give somebody wanting to start their own business? Um, uh, number one, I think it's possible. So if you think you have a good idea, um, instead of presuming that it's too hard or it's not possible, um, assume that may, it, it can probably happen. So that's the beginning. And then the second thing is, um, Try to do a very simple version of your idea and explain it to some people and then ask what they think are the problems with it. So um, it doesn't really work to ask someone if your idea is going to work because if they like you, they'll, they'll feel pressured to say yes. But if you say, you know, I'm thinking about doing this idea, what do you think will not work about it? It gives them the freedom to say, well, you know, no one will buy it. You know, <laughs> and then you can say, oh yeah, that's probably not gonna work. So I think believing in the idea and then asking people if they will actually pay money for it and then trying to build a simple version of that and get people paying for it um, right away um, is the key. I think the other thing that fits in all that is get spun up on some basic business concepts like how does profit and loss work and how does basic accounting work. Um, and then once you are ready to start the business, you'll be a little bit further ahead. All right. Well, thanks so much for hanging out with us, Ryan. Really appreciate it. Thanks for letting me invade. I appreciate it. That's it for this week's episode of The Treehouse Show. On Twitter, I am at Nick RP. And I am at Jay Cipher. Thanks so much for watching this episode of The Treehouse Show. For show notes and more, check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash go treehouse. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one and learn about web design, web development, mobile development, business, and more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. If you'd like to see more advanced videos and tutorials like this one, go to teamtreehouse.com and start learning for free.